Tonight we are going to hear from four other people, um, really about what they have been processing through the letters of First and Second Peter. And so, Eric, come on up. Hello. Am I on? No. Yes. There we go. Uh, my name's Eric. Um, and a couple things before I get started. Uh, I'm a little bit of a pinball speaker. I kind of go all over the place. Uh, so that's the first thing you need to know. So if I get off track, I'll try and come back. Uh, second is I'm 30 years old going on 12. So if my voice cracks, I'm going to laugh right with you. Um, so um, last week, uh, we had four different people um, share with what they had been learning. Uh, and what I thought was amazing was I had learned all those same things. And I think what's great about it is that as we go through this, I think we're all continually um, learning um, the same things. But uh, as I was looking through, I was trying to figure out what has God specifically said to me um, that was a common theme throughout, not just on individual week, um, but something that overall, um, as a person, as a community group, as a church, that I felt um, I was being guided in and that... Um, I needed to share, and um, I came up with three things. And the first thing is that um, we have hope, and that um, through everything we do, um, we have a different outlook from the community around us. And as we engage in culture, as we engage in our jobs, our marriages, our lives, um, our extracurricular activities, we have a completely different outlook um, than the people around us. So uh, I'm going to read first uh, Peter 1, 3 through 7. Uh, it said, uh, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through the test, sorry, that perishes through, it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, the hope that we have, um, based off of um, reading that, is that our hope lies in grace through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and I love the fact, um, what Dan shared last week, where he talked about stuff being stole out of his vehicle, and just trusting what God is doing, and that um, there are a lot of things that we can place hope in nowadays. And I do notice that uh, in topics, just in our daily lives, we come up with, politics and can you believe the government is doing this and we come up with can you believe the city council did that and we're often looking at what our friends are doing what our government is doing uh, and even things that happen in our own lives uh, whether it be our spouse or whether it be uh, the reliability of our car or whether it be our jobs and a promotion we're getting we place our hope that we're going to be able to accomplish these things based off of these variable things that um, really have no foundation. And that, you know, our jobs, our promotions, our educations, or our personal abilities are going to fail us every time. Um, and that when we place our hope in those things, um, inevitably they're going to crumble. But if we place our hope in the grace that we have, um, that's solid. So that was something that, in my heart, um, as th especially when Dan was talking, is all the different times I've noticed that I've relied on uh, my abilities or my promotions at work or whatever, that I thought, this isn't a big deal, I got this. Um, but that um, when those things let me down, um, why was I able to keep a positive attitude? And it's because ultimately our hope is not in those things. Um, it is um, in Christ. So First Peter 1.13 also says, uh, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, 
So um, while preparing our minds and setting our hope on that grace, we need to understand that that hope um, is regardless of outcome. Um, I'm glad that we talked about what we did uh, the, with um, the firefighters um, who died is because there's always a hope regardless of outcome. And I think that's where we differ from the community around us is that we understand with God's sovereignty is he's working um, beyond what we can see. And that when we look at a negative outcome, we have that hope that regardless of what happens to us, what happens to our car, what happens to our, if we lose our job, um, if our marriage fails, if, you know, we lose our home, whatever the case may be, that we understand that God is working in us and that that grace that he's extended to us gives us joy um, beyond those circumstances. Um, so, um, the second thing, sorry, the second thing is that um, how does this uh, relate to our community, our community involvement? Um, and uh, the second thing that stood out to me, especially from last week, um, was uh, what Jonathan shared about using our gifts. Um, we're called to be a part of this culture and part of our community, and that's something that's really been on my heart lately is what does, what does it look like to be active in our community, um, but at the same time, um, taking these principles to heart. Um, there is a quote, which I don't know where it went. Oh, um, and I don't remember what week um, this was from, but um, one of the points Chad used in one of his messages was, when people see that Christians understand them, they can catch a glimpse that God might be able to understand them also. That really struck me um, in kind of the same way that Jonathan was speaking about is because how are we going to convey that hope, that grace, that love to the people around us unless we are in those people and we are surrounded by them and we are involved with them. And I love the fact um, that Jonathan brought up something we've been talking about in our community group about getting involved uh, in communities outside of this church and our community group with the name of just fellowship because uh, there's something powerful about being able to uh, tell people who are non-saved who aren't in the church and even the people who are in the church that hey we have a group that uh, like Jonathan said likes to sew I really wanted to get a picture of Jonathan behind a sewing machine for you guys this week but that didn't happen <laughs> um, but there there are a lot of talents um, there are a lot of gifts uh, and there's a huge variety of people in this church. Um, and so that's been kind of laid on my heart to see that how we can, um, as a church, start developing these groups so that we can um, invade our community and our culture in a way that is non-threatening, but in a way that people can catch a glimpse of what hope and glory looks like uh, based off of the love that we are showing. So... Um, the verses for that one um, was 1 Peter 4, 8 uh, through 11. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, uh, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Uh, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that, ev uh, that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Um, so um, that was really um, something that is still on my heart, um, and I'm sure you guys will hear more about it, but trying to find out how we can start developing these groups to um, reach the community uh, and yet um, keep that mindset of that hope and grace uh, and extend it out to other people. Um, and the last thing um, that really struck me um, that is kind of a theme not only from last week but through um, 
pretty much since I've been at Second Mile. Um, I think there are things we read, we go over week, uh, week in and week out, uh, and there are lessons that are things that, oh, I knew that, or, oh, I remember reading that. And we go back and forth, and every time I hear something that I've known before, it may hit me a little different. Um, but what I think is important uh, is to continually remind one another. Um, and this one comes from Second Peter. Um, 1, 6 through, well, 15. Uh, I'll just read the first couple of verses because I'm running out of time. But it says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... Uh, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, um, and he says, in the end of this passage, he says, um, he says, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able to recall these things. Uh, and he says, therefore, I, in, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, um, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. And then in Second Peter 3, he also says that this is now the second letter I am writing to you, beloved. Uh, in both of them, I am stirring you up in sincere mind by the way of reminder. And I think this is important because we continually go through changes in life where, um, whether it be joyous times, hard times, struggles, is we often forget some of the lessons we may have learned previously. But for even the letter here to say, you already know these things, but I'm going to continually remind you of them because I feel it right as long as I'm here um, to remind you. And I think um, this is, sorry, that's my timer. Um, um, what are we supposed to remind each other of? And what we're going to remind each other of is um, the promises that God has given to us the promises of grace, forgiveness, strength, um, and the promises that um, his word continually gives us. And I know that part of being fed is being reminded myself time and time again of things that I know God is clearly speaking to me, but it's important um, to speak not only to each other, but people in the community, um, but especially to build each other up so that we're strengthened when we go out and to be able to look at someone and say, I know you're going through a hard time, but greater is he that is in you than is in the world, and that you are more than what the world says you are, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think oftentimes we get drowned out and we try and be supportive, but I think um, something especially that uh, sunk into me was that we need to continually remind each other um, of the hope and the grace that we have. Um, even though we may say, well, this is church, everybody knows Jesus loves them, but to remember to speak the truth uh, and speak it boldly so that we can be encouraged here so that when we get out there, um, we will be that grace to everybody else. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, I, Chad, well, hi, my name is Jenna. I'm Curtis's wife and one of the college ministry leaders here. I, <clears throat> Chad told me that I would be an A-plus student if I made slides, and I didn't make slides because I couldn't get past, like, what I would name the slide, and, I, <laughs> you know, because his names are pretty bomb, and the best I could think of was, eternity is kind of a big deal. It's, <laughs> yep, that's why I didn't pick slides. So, <laughs> in, in reflecting what I've learned in the past seven months in First and Second Peter, um, there were a lot of good themes, and I really just wanted to hone in on one, and really what God's been teaching me about is um, that eternity is a big deal, and that Jesus' second coming is more important than what I have uh, chalked it up to be, I guess. Um, I've had a pretty limited understanding of eternity and Jesus' second coming just due to my upbringing. I grew up in a pseudo-Christian home, so we went to church on Christmas and Easter, because that's when you go, I guess. And um, my dad was more the, um, the spiritual leader of the house. But his focus uh, in his faith was very much end time prophecy, um, 
when what modern day prophets are saying about Jesus' return and what prophecies have been fulfilled and stuff like that. So that's what I always associated with Jesus returning. And um, when I became a believer later on in life, in, in six, when I was 16, um, I kind of realized that wasn't what it was about. So as I picked up the Bible on my own, um, I read that God is basically keeping it a secret for when Jesus comes back, we're not going to know when. So I thought, well, if anyone's good at keeping secrets, it's probably God. So I'm not going to try and figure that one out, and I'm not going to waste my time. Um, another thing that I noticed with a lot of Christians was that, kind of like how Chad was talking about earlier in our series, um, you, either, you can see in people's lives whether or not they're missional or whether or not they've retreated from culture. And it seemed to me that a lot of people who focus so much on um, Jesus returning, or at least the ones I was exposed to, they tended to retract and just be like, okay, I really hope God gets here or I die in my sleep. So <laughs> I didn't want to be that kind of Christian either, and that wasn't the model that was really in the Bible. So um, the other point that I took away from you know, being a teenager digging in the Bible was a whole bunch of it is about um, what we do in the meantime. So I was like, well, you know what? I can put eternity on the shelf, and when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a great party. I'm super stoked. But in the meantime, I really want to be found. Um, well, I guess if Jesus is going to come like a thief, I want to be found with my hand on the plow, doing his work and being obedient, not just twiddling my thumbs, being like, hey, I didn't guess when you got back, but I tried, and yay, you're here. Awesome. So <laughs> anyway, so that was, that's been the focus of my faith for a really long time is just being obedient and looking at what God's put on my plate and saying, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do, I'll do my best. Um, oh, sorry. So this is the background I entered into with when we entered First and Second Peter. Um, so in First Peter 4, 12 and 13, this was kind of what got the ball rolling for me, that maybe uh, Jesus' second coming was more than what I had chalked it up to be and didn't deserve to just be on the shelf. Um, so in, that ver or in those two verses, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, um, but rejoice. And for me, that stood out like a sore thumb, because when I endure fiery trials, I'm sure as heck not rejoicing. Um, more often than not, even when I think of fiery trials, I'm like, okay, uh, bow your head, endure it, get through. There's a lot of fear involved. Um, but I'm definitely not rejoicing in the moment. So as Chad was reading that, I was like, these people are crazy, <laughs> but I'll really try to get it. Um, anyway, so um, again, I, and through this season of life, through the last seven months, I really have been struggling with fear. And one of the things that Chad brought up was perspective is everything. Um, and that really struck a chord in me because if I had an idea of what eternity was about and the way it applies to me now, maybe I wouldn't be struggling with perspective. I wouldn't be struggling with fear in the day to day. Um, one of the verse that, one, no, not verse, quotes. One of the quotes that he read was, if you read history, you will find that Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely, oh, that was close, ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. So if perspective is everything, um, and as C.S. Lewis said, if we really want to make, if I really want to make the difference that I'm hoping to make while I'm here, I really do have to have my eyes set on the greater good that is coming. Um, and if I want to go all out in my faith, which I do, I have to shed some of the crop that is holding me back and really focus on, like, what's the eternal value? What could possibly happen if I really focus on that? Um, so I'd miss the point. And like it says in Second Peter 1.19, if Jesus coming back is supposed to be a beacon of light that's, help, that's here to help us endure, it's definitely a dark place here. I'm sure I don't have to reiterate that at all, but um, that is what it's meant to serve as. And um, yeah, okay. So I also wanted to read Revelations 21, 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. 
He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them, will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, or crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And I realize if there's anything worth working for, it's that. Um, that's, I feel like m the majority of my Christian walk has been um, just be obedient, just honor God with your life, but that also, it's about bringing God here as fast as we can, I guess. Um, I was trying to think of an analogy for this, and the best thing I could think of was open water swimming. Um, and I'm a runner, so this is going to get interesting. Um, <laughs> but I figured I can't really screw it up because if Chad can compare our walk with Jesus to bowel movements, I cannot be that awkward, right? <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> okay, so when I was first starting into triathlons, I was going to do my first open water swim. It's where you're not in a lap pool. You're like in a lake or something cool. So my coach was like, all right, Jenna, prep yourself. Every few strokes, you got to lift up your head and make sure that you keep your eyes on where you're going because you will be shocked at how many swimmers just swim off course and lose valuable points in the race. So I was like, okay, okay, I can try and do that. Like, totally fine. So lo and behold, I get to my first race. I have my wetsuit on. I'm sitting in the water trying just watching the first heat go. And no joke, swimmers are just everywhere, like not even on course. And there are all these jet skis moving around like, hey, wrong way, buddy, wrong way, <laughs> look up. <laughs> so I was like, oh, wow, that's really important. OK, I'm not going to be that swimmer. Um, so I've been realizing that I have been that swimmer in my walk. I am probably like doo doo dawdling all over the stinking place. But I've lost the point that like the trajectory is forward. And while I've been wanting to be obedient, like the fuel and the gas that I need of eternity, I haven't really been using. Um, and just to a side note for swimming, as a runner, I am not super efficient in the water, but I'm like doing everything I can to like get forward. So I'm like pulling with my arms and kicking with my legs and trying to twist because that's what they tell you to do. And um, that is totally what the Christian life is like, at least in my mind, that you're doing everything that you can to just propel yourself forward to be more like Jesus. Um, okay. In Ecclesiastes um, 3.11... This, my friend recently got this tattoo, so I knew I should have brought, should bring it up today because it's meant to be. It said, it says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. Um, and I guess what, to wrap it all up, what God has really been teaching me is that he has hardwired me to long for his presence to be fully unleashed here. And that is what I'm working for, and that's what I hope to bring, and all of that. But that's also the juice and the energy and the air that I'm sucking when life is just hard and you're, like, really treading water. Um, and that's what it's meant to serve us, not just to be put on a shelf. Thanks. Hey, guys, I'm Curtis. Um, as Jenna mentioned, she's my wife, and both of us co-lead the college ministry together. Um, so Jenna said she tried for a title and failed. I tried also to match Chad's titles. Came up with this, this little gem. Translating internal understanding to external perception. It's good, right? Like, it doesn't make sense right now, but you think it'll probably make sense in the future. I thought it was pretty dead on to what Chad's used to. In sticking with what Chad usually does is because I think he's, he's great at it. I was trying to think of like an insanity workout uh, relationship to our spiritual walk. I failed at that, so I'm not even going to try. But, uh, okay, so I'll just get right in. For me, going through Peter, early on in First Peter, there was, um, I felt like a really reoccurring foundation was established of purification and growing up in your salvation. Um, this, this, that term exactly comes from 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, that says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So um, for me, it was taking verses like this, talking about purification and talking about um, just stabilizing yourself in your spiritual walk, talking about a lot of spiritual disciplines, and I was applying it to myself and not saying, 
you know, God, I, I hope I'm past the point of infancy in my faith. I, I feel like I'm doing a, a pretty decent job at applying um, a lot of these principles to my life and getting rid of a lot of the things that um, shouldn't be there. And I'm f uh, far from perfect, but that was, that was a part of my pursuit is the internal um, refinement. Another part of that was uh, truly understanding the truths in scripture, like digging deep with scripture. And um, so I wanted to share with you guys one particular piece that I pulled out and kind of ran with in trying to understand the, the, um, the deeper meaning behind some, some scripture. And so um, it was originally inspired by 1 Peter 2, 9, which says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And um, as we were going through through First Peter, I, I, this verse really stood out to me and said, man, there's such powerful words here. There's such powerful concepts, and I want to know more deeply what they mean. And to understand that, to go back to, you know, the original holy nation of God, I was exploring the Old Testament and... Um, and one of the deeper truths that stood out to me was the concept of, um, of remnants. In the Old Testament, uh, many times over, there's this motif of remnants of God's people turning away from him, but him pulling out a particular group and holding them close to himself and, and saving them. And so uh, one example from that is beautifully written in Isaiah 10:20 20 through 21. That says, in that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. So this concept of God taking his holy people and saving a remnant for himself just stood out to me in a tremendous way and gave so much more depth to, to that verse I read originally in First Peter. And then to take this um, truth even farther, it transfers over into the New Testament and... Um, really applies to our life. So uh, a verse that shows that really, really well is in Romans 11, 5 through 7, which says, So too, at, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel, ought, Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. So um, this truth took a completely new form when I discovered this, that that the chosen people of God, the remnant that God is saving for himself is now, is now us. It's now the elect and, and um, not exclusive to the Israelites anymore. And, and the, the truth like that was, was really overwhelming. I thought, well, this is, this is really incredible, you know, and dug deeper into that, that piece of the, the scripture. So I began internalizing these truths. I, I, you know, there was more examples of this in First Peter that I don't have time to share, but um, this stuff like this helped me to own my obedience to God more readily um, and also helped me using truths in scripture like this one which are such powerful truths um, to energize and motivate my faith so then at that point in our you know tra uh, transitions through first Peter and into second Peter I kind of realized that I was having this perception of okay I'm really internally refining myself I I am um, you know, getting rid of the bad, keeping the good, working on spiritual disciplines, digging deeper into scripture. And so clearly, if I'm doing better, then people are going to see it outside of me and they're just going to know God right away. And that's the end of it. And um, so as we dug deeper into Second Peter, it became obvious to me that this is a lie that I was believing, that, that there was another step that I was missing. And uh, this is really drawn out in a particular verse in Second Peter that says, um, in reference to adding faith and goodness and knowledge and self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, um, Peter describes in Second Peter 1.8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And th there was two bu buzz buzzwords in here that really stood out to me, ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge. Um, and this was a concept I hadn't really thought about before. My, my knowledge, my internal understandings of Scripture and of my walk with God, um, they should not be ineffective or unproductive. And um, 
this was paired with Chad asking a bunch of tough questions like, are you a person characterized by love? How would others describe you? And do you delight in relationships? And, and these things were like, well, what's my, what is my outward perception? How am I perceived by my coworkers and those that I interact with outside of my church community? And so I asked. I went and asked some of my coworkers, and they had some good things to say. And they said, oh, you're kind, you're motivated, you're ambitious. And then they also said, well, sometimes you come off as arrogant, sometimes you're grouchy. And I was like, what the heck? How did these get in there? And also, why are they, why are they not saying you're, you're Christ-centered or you're bringing up God and super awkward about it all the time? And I was like, that's what I wanted to be. And my, I felt like my ambition for my job to, to do well in my vocation translated to arrogance when I wanted to translate to I'm trying to glorify God through my vocation. And um, so I realized this disconnect. I was missing the last step to really, um, you know, use my internal understandings and knowledge to transfer to how I interact with culture. And so um, I started trying to transition how I approached this. I tr started trying to um, talk to my non-Christian friends about when I'm making a big decision, the biggest part of it is prayer. And I, was al I always had this fear, like, they don't understand that asking God is what I do. Like, that's not reasonable in a, you know, a non-Christian light, like, how, do you, how does that help you make a decision? But I didn't want to shy away from it, you know? And there was other things that I had this fear of, like uh, political correctness, or I don't want to offend somebody and make them uh, get defensive and, and are, you know, get into an argument. So I was, I was paralyzing myself with these things. So I started telling my friends that the most important things to me, you know, when the classic answers are family or doing well in your career, the most important things to me are eternal, which even if they don't make sense to you, I want to share that with you. And um, the other thing I started doing was telling my friends, hey, I, you know, with gentleness and respect, I, ha I am concerned about you and your eternal well-being. And not being afraid to, that's really tough to say to a friend. And I started, you know, trying it out with a bunch of friends and saying, I'm not scared to tell you that I care about you and I, I want the best for you. And um, through this transition and trying these different you know, strategies, I, it was actually incredibly rewarding. I, uh, I had one friend that told me, yeah, I've been thinking about this stuff all the time. I think about it almost every day. I love talking about it. And I was like, and it was one of the friends I thought, clearly we're gonna get in an argument and I'm gonna regret ever joining that conversation. And uh, this same friend, when I was like dabbling around political, being politically correct, it's like, you know, you don't have to believe this. It's just my, like, you know, I was being so careful. He's like, he's like, dude, stop. Um, handling me so carefully, I can handle you know the full truth and everything about that. So my community group makes fun of me because I, I was t sharing this with them, and I said, "Yeah, I just need to stop handling them with baby gloves." And I'm not really sure what baby gloves are. <laughs> it made sense. Like, I have, I'm not really into holding babies. I don't do it that much. But when Angela tried to hand me Elsie the first time, I was like, "Where are the baby gloves? Like, don't you need something to?" Anyway. But that is my ending message, is we don't need to handle our friends with baby gloves or kid gloves or whatever the f phrase really is. And uh, it's, it, it has been really rewarding for me. So thanks, guys. Hi, friends. My name is Angel, and I am married to Chad, and three of my kids are sitting over there. I, first, I'm, I'm just really happy to be here tonight. I've been thinking about you guys a lot this week, just processing different things that have happened over this year and how much you all have supported our family. And I know, I think I've gotten up on stage three times since I had the stroke. And every time I'm like, I just love you guys so much, but it's because I do. <laughs> and I really am deep in my guts, thankful for how you've supported our family and prayed for us and done crazy things and given lots of money and helped pay our medical bills. And so when we were in staff meeting talking about getting to uh, debrief Peter, I think Chad's kind of teased about it before that whenever he's in a big point in his messages or at the end of a message series, I want to stand up and yell, say law, 
Selah, which in Psalms means pause. Pause right here. I just want to pause and think. I don't like to go. I, I want to wait and hear. And so whenever we were talking about doing this, I said, oh, I would love to share. And then I thought, why did I say that? But it's because I did. I wanted to share. And so thank you for indulging me, telling you thank you, and I love you every time I get up here. It probably won't change anytime soon because I'm so <laughs> grateful that our family gets to be part of this body and that we get to hear the stories and have funny things in our culture like baby gloves and all that wonderful quirky things that Second Mile has. So thank you for being our family. And um, as Eric was sharing, I thought it was really interesting because he said he wanted to look at a theme and he came up with three things and I told Jed I did too. And then he started in with remembering and hope and I was like, oh, hmm, maybe I need to change my notes. but. I'm not going to. I'm just going to go with it. So, Eric, you were on my brain and I was on your brain this week as we were thinking. It will be difficult for me to just look at one different thing, at one specific lesson learned because my mind is a river. When I'm in a conversation, I can go from here to there to there. And people listening are like, that's not even connected. And it is most definitely connected in the river of my mind. And so when I'm looking at lessons from Peter, it's kind of the same thing. It's hard to break apart the last year. It was last August, almost a year ago, um, August 16th, that I had a stroke. It didn't impair motor skills or reasoning skills. It was in my right temporal lobe, which affects emotions and um, music. So for me to sing tonight is a really big deal. I'm really happy that I get to do that again. And my, my speech cadence is a little bit different. And if I do something like tonight, tomorrow I'm going to be tired. But that's okay because I'm getting better. And so when I was thinking about over the year, I just, I just felt so impressed about just being reminded of what God has done. And then it occurred to me that's what the women's retreat was about a month after I had the, retreat, uh, the stroke. It was all about remind the people. And it, started, it starts out saying, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. At one time, we too, all of us in here, were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Ah, oh, I'm so glad. And, and he asks us to remember that, to remember what he's done in our lives, to remember to do what is good, to remember hope, to remember the, the wonderful beauty of our salvation, to remember what we were like before so that we can more deeply rejoice in who he's made us to be now and who he's making us to be. The already and not yet. We're already saved, but we're not yet completely in heaven with Jesus. That, that's what I want my life to be. And so when I'm thinking of Peter, it's been full of reminders. As Eric said, the reminder of hope. Hope has been so important for me over the past year. Hope that I'm going to be able to sing again, that I'm not going to hate music and uh, one of the things with my symptoms is irrational irritability. And this last week at my parents, uh, they did a lot of fireworks. My parents spend, my family spend so much money on fireworks, you would be amazed. It is a weird cultural thing in New Mexico because you can just shoot them off in your backyard. I mean, it's really crazy. And so the cracking and the popping and the lights, I hadn't experienced major stroke, stroke symptoms in a while and I just started getting so mad. And one of the favorite firecrackers of my mom is called Noisy Boy. <laughs> Two minutes, pop, 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 flash, 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 flash. And after the fourth one, they bought 12, I turned to Chad and said, I'm gonna punch Noisy Boy in the face. And that has been my extreme statement is I'm gonna punch it in the face. And that's, that's what I say. Well, there have been a lot of times where I was like, I wanna punch these symptoms in the face or irritated at different things that's happening at school with the kids or, or, or the news or all kinds of stuff. And what has brought me back, even in my symptoms, is hope. There have been a lot of times in our ministry of Court of Hope that we've done for the past nine years and taking gifts to women and clubs 
we, we haven't seen anybody give their life to Jesus. We haven't seen any of the dancers say, I don't want to work here anymore. Would you help me find a job? And so it is very easy for me, who can be a little bit heavy-hearted, to say, why do we even do this? Because we have hope. And if at any point we lose hope, we're out. Just give up. Go on. Move on. Just keep walking. But I don't want to lose hope. And Chad talked a lot about hope in this. 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be giving, given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Hope reminds me to enjoy the fullness of my salvation, the gift of my salvation, and the enormity of my salvation. That there have been so many times where even just being alive, that I've been so thankful for the hope that my stroke wasn't more serious. That when I'm able to go out walking, that I'm not complaining, that I'm not getting to teach my spin classes or do something like that, that I can say, God, you have given me hope today that I can go and walk and I can meet people at the park and talk to them. The other thing that I've been reminded of is uh, being, doing good in our city, doing good in my life. And it says that in Titus, that that's the second little part. Remind the people to dot, 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 continue to do good. And so I've thought a lot about that. What does it mean to do good? And Chad, at first I was um, kind of a little bit taken aback when he, I felt like it was very simple, that he talked about God's will is to do good, that he used the verses in 1 Peter 5, 15, and 1 Peter 4, 19. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. 1 Peter 4, 19, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and to continue to do good. And he said like three times, if you want to know God's will, it's to do good. I was like, I, I need more. I need more than that. I want to know what does it mean to do good. And, and it means a lot of things. For me, it means not complaining, not grumbling. It means choosing to have a joyful heart, knowing that that's good medicine for my soul. It means opening my mouth when I have the opportunity. I think Curtis being vulnerable with his coworkers. I mean, I don't know how many of us would go to people that, that we kind of know, not really, and say, hey, could you crit critique me? And that, that takes a lot of courage. That's doing good. That is doing good for the glory of God. And a lot of times for my own heart, I am, um, my dad used to tell me that I was a woman with a cause, whether there was a cause or not. And you've heard me say before that I can be passionate about ice cream. You'll be glad to know that as I've entered my 40s, I'm not passionate about stuff like that. My passion has been refined. I can still get excited about a lot, but being passionate about people and my kids and my marriage and Second Mile and, and sharing Jesus with people definitely has grown and, and made me really excited and excitable. Like sometimes I'm just like, yes, let's do this. In doing good, however, sometimes when I'm watching the news or hearing about the firefighters or seeing the violence on TV or the devastation of weather, my heart starts to feel very heavy and um, my flesh is tempted towards apathy to be like, why even bother? What's the point of doing good? A really cheesy illustration of that was a few years ago, I don't remember when, it's when um, Chad and I decided to bring our own bags to the store and I was really going to try to make a concerted effort to live and leave less of a footprint. So I'm going to bring bags. That's an easy thing to do. And I was standing at line at Target and there was a lady in front of me buying a bunch of plants. And she said, can I have a few bags to take to put in my trunk? I'm not kidding. That person probably gave her a hundred plastic bags. And I was like, Psh, why bother? Forget about it. And that, that is a silly illustration that can weigh heavy on me. But that, that is the truth, that sometimes I'm like, what difference do we make? What difference do we make? What difference can I make in the lives of, of the family members who lost loved ones this week? I, I don't know. But it also comes back to hope. Those two things go together. I hope and pray that Jesus makes his name great among those people. I hope and pray that the churches, like Chad prayed, respond with gentleness and respect and no Christianese whatsoever. I hope and pray that God's name is made huge in our city, despite all of the heaviness that is around us. And without doing good, 
then I'm just sitting around hoping. So for me, those go hand in hand. I hope that God does wonderful things in our city. So I choose to do good to bring him glory. This has been great reminders in my life for First and Second Peter. The next one, the last one, the third one, um, that, that brings it all together for me is that he, God is equipping us. He's totally equipped us. So he doesn't just ask us to have hope and to do good, but he's equipped us to do these things. And when Chad teaches through scripture that I've memorized, I, I'm sure when I got up here, there are some of you that said, oh, she's going to talk about memorizing scripture. <laughs> yeah, I am. That's what I talk about. But when, when Chad teaches through scripture that I've memorized, it is like the best high-definition television you can ever imagine. And that's been another great thing over the past couple months is scripture memory has been virtually impossible for me over the last 11 months, but it's getting better. So I can memorize little short, short proverbs now, but what I've memorized in the past is coming back. And I feel like 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11 inspired me and uh, really helps me push through the pain of the therapy of training my brain to do that again. And so when he was teaching through that, it excited me so much because nine years ago in July, Chad and I and some of our friends came here for a vision trip to see if we wanted to move to Tucson to plant a church. And that was the passage that I was memorizing. And so to see that come full circle to, to say, I'm memorizing this when we're, when we're moving here, trusting that God is going to give us everything we need for life and godliness in Tucson. Whoa, look at what he's done over the past nine years. I mean, to, to sit in our living room with 10 of us, 12 of us, 15 of us, starting to say, Chad, can we please meet somewhere else? I'm tired of sitting in my living room. And then to grow to this, even tonight, I thought, well, there's a lot of people out for 4th of July, so there may not be very many people here tonight. And I almost started crying in worship, saying, God, you are so faithful. Look at the people here that have come to worship you tonight together. And so knowing that he, through, through the last nine years, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. And thinking through those things a little bit deeper, Mm. verse 5 says well okay let me go back a little bit when he's talking about knowledge of him he's given us his very great and precious promises that we may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires so this is one of my favorite parts because it's such strong language and as a prophet I really like strong language it says for this reason make every effort make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And a lot of times in the doing good, I'm like, whoa, what do I do? Well, this is the list. This is the list of doing good. It's not specific tasks. It's being aware. It's being self-controlled. It's being perseverance. It's loving people. That's what doing good is. Being aware, asking God, God, today show me where I can do good for your glory. Show me what I can do to make your name great. Show me what I can do to humbly serve and not be noticed at all. Show me what I can do to be quiet. Show me what I can do to increase my awareness of the people around me and see them as you see them. That's what doing good is. And right there, it says to us that we can make every effort to add to our faith to do these things. And a lot of us make every effort to do a lot of things. Chad does insanity. I was going to show you my insanity kicks like he did that day, but I'm not going to. Because <laughs> he would be like, whoa, she's so awesome. Just kidding. <laughs> we make every effort to... Pick the best fantasy football team. Oh, that's sacred ground I just walked on, isn't it? We make every effort to be the very best in our job. We make every effort to make our appearance in social media be better than everybody else's or cooler than every, everybody else's or at school. Or you make every effort for good things too, to do well in your career, to make good grades. Those are good things. But are we making every effort to add to our faith these things? And when Chad talked through that, I thought, you know, I don't know if I am. 
I don't know if I am making every effort to add these things to my faith. And so once again, I just began repeating that passage over and over in my mind, meditating, asking God, increase these character, characteristics in my life. Increase them for your glory. Be known in my life. And I think probably the more these increase, the more I decrease. The more my flesh gets out of the way and the more his spirit comes out of me to be able to do the things that bring him glory. And that's what I want. And it comes with a promise. It's not just do these things and do good. It says if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, that, that is a fear. I don't want to be unproductive or ineffective in anything, in parenting, in my marriage with my friends. I want to bring him glory. I'm thankful that he is continuing to teach me these things. In turning 40 this year, I, I asked God to teach me great and wonderful things in my 40s about him, and I feel like he is being faithful to his promises. And I know that through your prayers and, and your love for our family and your prayers for healing of my brain, things are starting to connect again. I still have a little brain damage, but it's okay. I'm getting better. That was funny. <laughs> 